about Mendelian dihybrid cross. In monohybrid cross, Mendel studied the inheritance of only one trait at a time. But in an organism, many different characters are present. The factors that control them are also different. So, the inheritance of these factors will affect each other. To understand this, Mendel performed a dihybrid cross of a garden pea plant, a cross in which two contrasting characters are studied is called dihybrid cross. We know that organisms that have same allele for a trait, they are homozygous for that trait. Parents taking part in dihybrid cross are homozygous for two traits. Let's understand this experiment. In a dihybrid cross, Mendel selected two homozygous plants. In one, the pods were green in color and inflated and in second plant, pods were yellow in color and constricted. By crossing these, Mendel obtained seeds and grew the first filial generation that is F1 generation. The pods of all plants of this generation were green and inflated. Pause the video and identify dominant characters. Right, in F1 generation, the green color of pods was expressed, so this is dominant on yellow color and pods were inflated, that's why Inflated character is dominant on constricted character. That is, yellow color and constricted pods are recessive characters. We represent dominant characters by capital letter and recessive characters by small letter. We know that offspring produced by sexual reproduction has two options for each other. A variant of the gene is called allele. For example, here there are two forms of pod color, green and yellow, and two forms of pod shape, inflated and constricted. Parents of F1 generation are homozygous for color and shape of the pod. So, they have the same allele for a character. Genetic constitution of any organism is called its genotype. Therefore, the genotype of the parent with green and inflated pod is like this. And the genotype of parent with yellow and constricted pod is like this. Since both parents have the same alleles for two characters, that's why there is formation of only one type of gamut in each parent. Therefore, the genotype of offspring formed by fusion of these two gametes would be like this. The external appearance of any organism is called its phenotype. The phenotype of plants of F1 generation will have green color an inflated shape of pods. In these plants, there are two different alleles for pod color and pod shape. Organisms that have different pair of alleles for one character are called heterozygous. This is also called hybrid. Plants of F1 generation are heterozygous for two characters. Therefore, these are called dihybrid. Mendel grew plant seeds of F1 generation and self pollinated the plants. So, can you tell me how many types of pods would have been produced in the F2 generation? Let me tell you. On the basis of monohybrid cross, we can say that. 
some of the pods produced in F2 generation will be green and inflated and some pods will be yellow and constricted. But in F2 generation, four types of pods were produced. The F2 generation had different combination of color and shape, from which two combinations were same as that of parents and two combinations were new. All these pods were in the ratio of 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. This ratio is called dihybrid ratio. Mendel found that in the parent generation, inflated pod was green in color and constricted pod was yellow in color. But in F2 generation, there were pods which were inflated but were yellow in color. Similarly, there were pods which were constricted but green in color. This suggests that the inheritance of color of pod and shape of pod do not affect each other. This means that the color and shape of the pod is inherited independently. For this, the factor governing them has been segregated independently. On the basis of this understanding, Mendel proposed a third law of inheritance, which is called the law of independent assortment. According to this, when two pairs of contrasting characters are taken in a dihybrid cross, the inheritance of one pair is independent of the other. Or in other words, when two pairs of contrasting characters are taken in a dihybrid cross, each pair of factors is assorted independently. Let's understand this in a better way. Here, the genotype of the dihybrid plant is this. In this plant, at the time of formation of gametes, the combination of alleles will occur such that each gamete will receive only one allele for each character. Since here, alleles of two characters are present, therefore, these will be assorted independently and these gametes will be formed. Here, allele of green color of pod will be present in 50% alleles. Similarly, allele of yellow color of pod will be present in 50% of gametes. Similarly, you can see that each of the alleles of inflated and constricted pods is also present in 50% of the gametes. If we self-pollinate this dihybrid plant, then can you tell the genotype and phenotype of plant produced? Pause the video and try to find this with the Punnett square. Let me tell you, here the male gametes are like this and the female gametes are like this. For this, we will write male and female gametes in two sides of Punnett square. We will write the fusion of these gametes in the square shown like this. Now, we can see that in 16 parts of Punnett square, there are 9 different genotypes. That's why, the genotypic ratio of dihybrid cross is this. But under the rule of dominance, dominant character will be expressed. Therefore, in F2 generation of dihybrid cross, only four phenotypes will be obtained. The ratios of this is as follows. So now you must have understood the law of independent assortment of inheritance. So today we have learned about the Mendelian dihybrid cross.
Today we will learn Mendelian monohybrid cross. This is Rahul's family. Rahul and Rahul's mother have brown eyes, while his father has blue eyes. Can you tell me why Rahul's eye color is not blue? We get the answer for this question with the help of Mendelian monohybrid cross. Let's understand it. Hybridization of two garden pea plants with a pair of contrasting characters is called monohybrid cross. The tallness and dwarfness are contrasting characters for height. Mendel hybridized a tall plant with a dwarf plant and produced the first filial generation, that is, F1 generation, from the seeds obtained. All the plants of this generation were tall. Then, he self-pollinated the F1 generation plants and grew the second generation, that is, F2 generation plants. All the plants in F1 generation were tall. But, in F2 generation, the ratio of tall plants to dwarf plant was 3 is to 1. No plant was of intermediate height, that is, height in between the two. This means that the information of tallness and dwarfness must have been transmitted without any change from parent generation to the F1 generation and from F1 generation to the F2 generation. After understanding this fact, Mendel proposed that a certain object gets inherited from the parent to the offspring during reproduction which develops specific characters in the offspring. Mendel called this object as factor. We call it a gene. Based on the above fact, we can say that gene is a unit of heredity. All F1 generation plants were tall, but the F2 generation had a mixture of tall and dwarf plants, meaning that F1 generation plants must have inherited both tallness and dwarfness traits from the parent generation. Therefore, there must be both the factors, that is, tallness and dwarfness, present in the F1 generation plant. However, only the trait of tallness gets expressed. With this understanding, Mendel proposed the law of dominance, according to which, in every individual, the characters are controlled by factors. Due to involvement of two parents in sexual reproduction, factors are found in pairs. There are different forms of a trait, so the factors of that trait also have different forms. These are called alleles. The allele is a pair of factors, may be similar or different. If in the pair of factors, the two alleles are different, then only one of the factor is allowed to get expressed. The factor that gets expressed is called the dominant factor or dominant gene, while the factor that remains idle is called the recessive trait or recessive gene. Thus, only one copy of the dominant factor ensures expression of the dominant character. Similarly, for the expression of the recessive trait, both factors in the pair of factors must be recessive. Similarly, both tall and dwarf plants appeared in the F2 generation. None of the plants were of medium height, that is, a mixture of long and dwarf traits did not appear. On the basis of this understanding, Mendel introduced the law of segregation, according to which alleles of a trait do not mix with each other, meaning that the alleles of a trait remain pure in the pair. During the formation of gametes, alleles get separated, that is, each gamete get only one of the two alleles in pure form. In this way, the number of chromosomes in gametes is half 
that of the other cells. At fertilization, the alleles of the male gamete and the female gamete pair again and thus the number of chromosomes becomes normal. Inheritance can be understood through Punnett square. In this, we arrange the male and female gametes vertically and horizontally and find the possible combinations. We represent the dominant factor with uppercase letters and the recessive factor with lowercase letters. For example, tallness can be represented by uppercase T and dwarfness with a lowercase t. Since the parental generation plants are a pure lineage, we can express the factors of traits, that is, the pair of genes as TT or TT, like this. According to the law of segregation, the factors in the pairs get separated during gamete formation. If we cross the two gametes, we will get an unequal pair of factors in F1 generation. Therefore, the dominant trait T gets expressed. After self-pollinating the F1 generation plants, F2 generation plants will have various combinations like this. Since tallness is a dominant character, therefore these plants will grow tall. And in plants that have both recessive factors, they will be dwarf. Physically expressed traits of any organism such as tallness and dwarfness are called phenotypes and the ratio of these traits is called phenotypic ratio. Here, the phenotypic ratio is 3 is to 1. Similarly, the factors or genes that regulate the traits are called genotypes. If we talk about genotypic constitution of these plants, then we get their genotypic ratio like this. Now suppose if round trait which is expressed as R is dominant for the seeds and the wrinkle trait which is expressed as R is recessive, then what will be the result of breeding between the plant having RR genotype and a plant having RR genotype? Try this with the help of Punnett square. So today we have learned Mendelian monohybrid cross. cross. Some of the basic concepts related to heredity. Each organism generates another organism similar to itself through the process of reproduction. We call the new organism offspring or progeny and the organism that produces offspring is called parent. In appearance, the offspring matches its parents but it is not a true copy of the parent. When we talk about a child being similar to its parent, then we meant about the characteristics which are similar between parent and the offspring. Various features that we see are called trait. In the process of reproduction, these traits are transmitted from one generation to the next through gametes. The transfer of various traits from parent to child is called heredity. In other words, inheritance of traits from one generation to the next is called heredity. If we look at the living organisms of a species, they do not look alike. Their basic structure is similar, but they differ from each other in characteristics such as height, complexion, 
etc. The difference among various individuals of a species are called variations. Over generations, variations also get accumulated. For example, consider this as a bacteria which produces two individuals during reproduction. We can see traits inherited from a parent to its next generation. In addition to this, we also see some variations. Each individual in turn produces two more individuals similar in characteristics to that of parent but have individual differences also. In the same way, there is inheritance of traits and variations from generation to generation. Sexual reproduction produces more variations than asexual reproduction. Try to find its reason by your own. Suppose there is a species of red insect on a tree. Due to accumulation of variations over generation, there is a rise of new variety of green insects. Suppose if a bird comes to live on that tree, it can easily find and eat red insects. But green insects can hide themselves in the green color of leaves. In this way, there will be a possibility of survival of the insect species. In this way, variations helps in survival of the species. Therefore, we can say that the variations in reproduction are the basis of evolution. Let us understand the mechanism of heredity. The body of an organism is made up of cells. The nucleus of cells consists of DNA. Just as a cookbook is a source of information for cooking, DNA in cells is a source of information for synthesizing proteins. Just as the information about making some dish is stored at any place in the cookbook, the DNA contains specific segments for synthesizing specific proteins. We call each segment a gene. The information contained in the gene is called hereditary code. The gene of a protein regulates the synthesis of protein and in turn regulates the expression of a character. In this way, the expression of traits is controlled by genes. So, genes are called unit of heredity. The code of every character is stored in the form of genes in the DNA. Therefore, characters are transmitted from one generation to the next by transmitting the DNA through reproduction. That's why we call DNA as the hereditary material. In the cell, DNA forms some thin long thread-like structures called chromosomes. As the gene is a specific path on DNA, therefore, it is also a specific part of the chromosome. Chromosomes are kept very close to each other in the cells so as to form a nucleus. A gene may have different variants that control different traits. Different form of a same gene are called alleles. For example, genes of tallness and genes of doffness are alleles for the trait called height. To understand heredity, we represent them with these letters. Here, tallness and dwarfness are different traits of same gene. We call these as contrasting characters. Allele in an organism may be the same or may also be different. Such organisms that have the same pair of alleles for a triad are called homozygous. And such organisms which have different pairs of alleles for one trait are called heterozygous. Remember that the branch of science under which 
we study genes, variations, and heredity is called genetics. So today we have learned some basic concepts related to heredity. heredity. About sex determination. We know that male and female participate in sexual reproduction. Since both sexes participate in sexual reproduction, probability of offspring being a male or a female is equal. It is therefore interesting to know whether a zygote will develop into a male or a female. The development of zygote into male or female during reproduction is called sex determination. The sex determination of an organism depends on various factors. For example, sex determination in some organisms depends on the environment, such as in some animals like reptiles, the temperature at which the fertilized egg is kept determines whether the offspring will be a male or a female. Some animals, such as snails, may change their sex. That means the sex determination in snails is not genetic. Sex determination in humans is genetically determined. Let's understand the sex determination in humans. In the previous video, we learned that the expression of a trait depends on the gene. Sex determination of zygote also depends on genes. Humans have a total of 46 chromosomes, which make 23 pairs of chromosomes. Out of these, 22 pairs of chromosomes, that is, 44 chromosomes are the same in male and female. They have no role in determining the sex of the zygotes. These are called somatic chromosomes. But one pair in the 23 pairs of chromosomes differ in male and female. In females, both chromosomes of this pair are of normal size, which we denote by XX. But in males, the chromosomes of this pair are different. Of these, the chromosome of normal size is represented by X and the chromosome of smaller size is represented by Y. The sex of zygote is determined on the basis of these chromosomes, that is, X and Y. Therefore, we call these chromosomes the sex chromosomes. In this way, pair of sex chromosomes in males is XY and in the females, the pair of sex chromosomes is XX. When a male sperm is produced in a male, 23 pair of chromosomes are divided in such a way that one chromosome of each pair is acquired by each sperm cell. In this way, half the sperms have X chromosomes and half the sperm have Y chromosome. Since the sex chromosome in females is XX, therefore, all the reproductive cells, that is X, have X chromosome. During fertilization, if the sperm with the X chromosome fuses with egg containing X chromosome, the sex chromosome of zygote produced will be XX, which will develop female traits. But if the sperm with Y chromosome fuses with the egg containing X chromosome, then the sex chromosomes of zygote will be XY, which develops male traits. Since half of sperms have X chromosome and half of sperms have Y, therefore the probability of zygote being male is same as that of being a female. Similarly, all children get an X chromosome from the mother, so their sex determination depends on the chromosome obtained from the father. 
If the child inherit the X chromosome from the father, then it will be a girl child. And if the child inherits Y chromosome from the father, then the child will be a boy. This happens completely at random. So it is wrong to hold the father or mother responsible for not having an infant of any particular gender. Think about this. So today we have learned about sex determination. Learn about some important things related to evolution. We will also discuss inherited and acquired traits. Nearly 3.5 billion years ago, there was no life on earth. But today, we see millions of species of plants and animals on earth. There are organisms from the simplest form such as bacteria to those with complex body organizations such as humans. Many of these organisms are present in extremely hot places like volcanoes and many in extreme cold places like Earth's pole. How do you think so much biodiversity would have arisen on Earth? Think about it. We get the answer from the study of evolution. To find out how the organisms have evolved, we need to know how different species originated in time. To understand this, we consider the external shape and behavior of organisms as the basis. The description of the external shape and behavior of an organism is called its characteristics. For example, different organisms have four legs. It is a characteristic. Plants can do photosynthesis. It is also a characteristic. We can classify organisms on the basis of similar characteristics. For example, the body of all organisms is made up of cells. So, we can put all organisms on the first level. At the next level, we will see characteristics that are common among most organisms but not among all. For example, most organisms have nucleus in their cells but bacteria do not have distinct nucleus. Then, we will classify those organisms which have nucleus into unicellular organisms and multicellular organism. At the next level, we can classify multicellular organisms based on ability to do photosynthesis. Then, we can take the body structure into consideration at the next level. Thus, here you can see development of a hierarchy where similar organisms are placed in a group. This hierarchy will take us to a situation where we will know that life has originated from abiotic substances. If we look at the hierarchy, we will know that the mistakes in DNA copying and as a result of sexual reproduction, there are microscopic changes from generation to generation. As a result, variations have occurred which have led to different species. We also see that the species which are adapted to changes in the environment survived, whereas those species which were not adapted were vanished. The accumulation of changes in the organisms over generations is called evolution. By evolution, we mean creation of biodiversity and selection by nature. Remember, evolution does not mean progress. For example, bacteria are ancient creatures as compared to humans. Bacterial body structure is much simpler than human body structure. But, bacteria can survive in extreme heat. However, humans can't. 
So, would it be fair to say that humans are more advanced or evolved than bacteria? Discuss this with your friends. Now, let's discuss another aspect of development. Some characteristics such as height, nose shape, color blindness, dimples can be transmitted from one generation to the next. Such characteristics are called inherited traits. Inherited traits are stored in the DNA of gametes. Therefore, these are transmitted from one generation to the next which takes the organisms to evolution. Those traits like dance art, weight, maintenance of hair which the organism acquires during their lifetime are called acquired traits. Acquired traits lead to changes in non-reproductive tissues but it does not cause change in DNA of the gametes. Hence, during generation, there is no inheritance of acquired traits from one generation to next. That is, the acquired traits are not inherited from one generation to the next. Since the acquired traits are not inherited, we cannot call development of tissues from the acquired traits as evolution. In this way, these traits do not lead the organism to the evolution. Now, an interesting question for you. If Rahul's mother has attached earlobe and Rahul's father also have attached earlobe and both are good swimmers, then what can be said certainly about Rahul? Rahul's earlobes will be joined and Rahul will also be a good swimmer. Rahul's earlobes will be joined but it is not certain that Rahul will be a good swimmer or not. What is your answer? Absolutely right. The attached earlobe is an inherited character whereas swimming is an acquired character. Hence, the second option is the correct answer. So today we have learned about some important things related to evolution. We have also discussed inherited and acquired traits. Learn about natural selection and genetic drift. There is a population of white rabbits residing on a hill. Some time after, a fox comes to live on the hill. The fox hunts these rabbits for its survival. Gradually, the number of rabbits on the hill decreases. We know that sexual reproduction produces variations in the population of all organisms. Suppose there is an occurrence of color variation during reproduction of white rabbits. Due to this, now brown rabbits also appear in the population. Brown rabbits will give their brown color to their progeny, because of which the color of all their offspring will be brown. The number of white rabbits here is higher than the number of brown rabbits. So, white color is a common feature in this situation. The color of the soil of the hill is brown. Fox can easily see white rabbits on brown soil while brown rabbits cannot be easily seen. Hence, fox hunts more white rabbits than brown rabbits. The more the white rabbits fox hunts, the less will be the white rabbits available for breeding. So, the population of white rabbits decreases. Conversely, brown rabbits remain hidden from the fox. So, more brown rabbits will become available for breeding. 
so their population increases. After a few generations, the number of white rabbits will be much less than the brown rabbits. In this way, white color that was initially a common characteristic in the rabbit population became the rare characteristic, while brown color that was rare characteristics in the beginning now became the most common characteristic. If the brown variation had not emerged, in this case, the rabbit's population would have reached on the verge of destruction. But due to the variation of brown color, the rabbit's population is now getting the survival advantage. Changes that give the organism the benefit of survival in the environment are called adaptation. Another important thing comes up here. Can you tell me? What is that? Think about it. Let me tell you, this change has occurred with the arrival of the fox on the hill. Had the fox not arrived on the hill, the situation would be different. That is, in this situation, nature has chosen brown color. Similarly, Nature selects those organisms for survival and for reproduction which have the necessary adaptations to cope up the changing environment. That is what we call natural selection. Natural selection is a process in which organisms with favorable traits are more likely to survive. From this we understand that Natural selection is taking the organism towards evolution. The theory of natural selection was proposed by Charles Darwin, in which he said that all organisms compete for different needs like space, food and shelter and to survive in extreme conditions. The organisms which show the necessary adaptations win in this competition and survive. For example, some organisms are taller in height. They can eat the leaves and fruits of tall trees, which lower living organisms cannot. The skin of some creatures is thick, so they can live in a cold region. But thin-skinned creatures are unable to live in a cold state. Living organisms reproduce and transmit the variations to next generations. Often, it gives rise to new species. In this way, organisms evolve by natural selection. Now, let's talk about another interesting fact of evolution. Now, suppose a rabbit with brown eyes lives on the hill due to the variation. Rabbits with blue eyes are produced in the population. This time, only the eye color has changed in the rabbits. Therefore, foxes can hunt all rabbits. This reduces the size of the rabbit population, that is, the number of rabbits is reduced. One day, a lot of rabbits are killed due to volcanic eruptions on the hill. But incidentally, some blue-eyed rabbits survived. Now, their population grows, but now, majority of rabbits have blue eyes. In this way, due to sudden accident in the rabbit's population, the character of brown eyes, which was common in earlier case, became rare and the character of blue eyes, which was rare, are now normal. Here, the accident of rabbits with blue eyes was mere a coincidence from which few rabbits were survived and hence the population. In this situation, the difference in the color of the eyes did not help in survival. Here, due to an accident, there was a change in the common character of the eye color, that is, brown. In other words, we say that due to accidents, the frequency of genes of brown color was changed. In this way, random changes in the frequency of a gene 
by chance is called genetic drift. Genetic drift is directly related to the size of the population. If the size of population is small, then the genetic drift will be more. Therefore, the number of organisms must be very large in the population of the organism, such that there will be more chances of survival of the organisms from the sudden accident and thus there will not be much effect on the frequency of the genes, that is, there will be no genetic drift. So, genetic drift affects the diversity of organisms and also plays an important role in the evolution of organisms. Now, you must have understood natural selection and genetic drift. So, today we have learned about natural selection and genetic drift. About speciation. We know that during sexual reproduction, the offspring inherits traits of the parent and also inherit some variations as well. Due to these variations, there are developments of certain characters in the organism which are different from that of parents. In this way, accumulation of small changes in the characteristics of organisms from generation to generation are called microevolution. Microevolution results in small changes to the normal characteristics of the organism, but still different organisms of same population can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. A group of organisms in which all organisms can reproduce and give birth to fertile offspring is called species. Human beings is a species known as Homo sapien. You can gather data about some of the species and write their scientific names. Sometimes, due to various reasons, existing species of organisms get divided into two groups that cannot interbreed with each other and cannot produce fertile offspring. In such a situation, we say that new species have been developed from the existing species. We call it speciation. Let us discuss various factors responsible for speciation. Natural selection There are variations in the population of an organism. Many changes occur in the environment of the organism. In such a changing environment, only those organisms survive that are well adapted to the changing environment. Those organisms which do not have favorable adaptation get slowly eliminated. Those who survive transfer these beneficial traits to their offsprings. Due to accumulation of such changes over generations, the population of organism evolves. Sometimes, the new generation becomes so different that it can't interbreed with old generation. So, we say that a new generation has emerged, that is, speciation has happened. Genetic Drift In the population of an organism, there are different alleles for any trait. The set of alleles present in the organism of a species is called its gene pool. Due to events like natural calamity, there are changes in the frequency of alleles which happen solely by chance. We call it genetic drift. Due to this, the new population becomes genetically different from the old population. Often, the evolution of the new population takes place such that there is development of new species. If the population of the organism is large, then there is negligible impact of random events on the allele's frequency. 
Hence, in such cases, we cannot see genetic drift. Geographical isolation Due to various reasons, such as availability of food, the population of organism gets divided into two parts. Many times, geographical situations, such as development of deep trench, obstruct the contact between the two population. We say that the two populations are separated geographically. Due to this, the organisms of two groups cannot reproduce with each other and thus the genes of one group cannot be transferred to the other. If the geographical conditions are different, then the natural selection and evolution in two populations takes place differently. They become different from each other over generations. Many times, this results in development of two different species. In these three situations, speciation can happen in different ways like changes in DNA or change in number of chromosomes. Then, the gametes of both groups cannot fertilize, thus resulting in speciation. Thus, Today we have learned about speciation. speciation. Today we will learn about evidences of evolution. There are various species around us and they are evolving at a slow rate. Evolution is the result of the accumulation of variations over many generations. Several proofs can be given about evidence of evolution. Let's understand them. Characteristics is the description of an external shape or behavior. If different organisms have the same characteristics, then it can be inferred that they must have evolved from the common ancestor. In this way, if the characteristics of two species are closely related, then they must have common ancestor. But if the two species have a distant relationship, it means that their ancestors will be similar, but much before the previous case. In this, by creating links in the past, we can reach the early species of evolution. If this method is correct, then it can be assumed that life must have originated from the inorganic substances. Let us discuss various evidences in the context of evolution. Evidence from classification There are many species of plants and animals on earth. If we classify them on the basis of natural similarities and differences, for example, kingdom, phylum or division, class, order, family, genus and species, then we get the idea of how various groups would have evolved. Evidence from homologous organs Seals flipper Bats petagium, humans hands, all have the same basic structure, but they are used for different purposes. For example, petagium to fly, seal flippers to swim, and man's hand to hold. Such structures are called homologous structures. Homologous structures suggest the same ancestor, that is, these organisms must have evolved from the common ancestor. Evidence from analogous organs In birds, bats and butterflies' wings have the same functions, that is, flying in the air, but their origin and basic structure are different. When different groups of organisms have the same habitat, then they develop similar structures in the appearance and action which gives them the survival advantage. In this way, if the organs are similar in appearance, 
and function, but the basic structure and origin are different, then they are called analogous organs. Analogous structures provide evidence of a different ancestor. Are sweet potato and potato also analogous to each other? Try to find its answer by yourself. Evidence from vestigial organs Organisms have organs that were functional in the ancestors but have now these are not at all useful. These are called vestigial organs. As in ancestors of humans, the vermiform appendix was helpful in digestion of cellulose. During development, humans became omnivores and the amount of cellulose in food decreased. This made the vermiform appendix as the vestigial organ. Evidence from fossils The preserved remains of a dead organisms are called fossils. One method of finding out how old fossils are is by digging down into the earth. The deeper the fossils are found in the ground, the older they are. Other methods are fossil dating, in which fossils are timed based on the ratio of different isotopes of carbon found in a fossil. From the study of fossils, it is known that the body organization of the oldest living organisms was simple and gradually became complex with time. That is, slowly with the time, the complex organisms evolved from the simplest organisms. Archaeopteryx was an ancient bird whose fossils gives us the idea that birds have evolved from reptiles. It is the connecting link between these animals. Evolution is the result of bit-by-bit -bit changes that happen over generations. For example, in planaria, an eye-like structure is present but it was very simple. The eyes of some animals cannot detect color. The eyes of human being are much developed as compared to eyes of these animals. Molecular phylogeny The changes occurring in DNA during reproduction is a basic event in evolution. These changes progressively accumulates in the next generation. If the DNA of two organisms are closely related, then it means that the two organisms have a close relationship. Molecular phylogeny deals with tracking how these changes took place in the past. From this, it can be identified from which organism an organism has evolved. Some species have evolved from artificial selection. Artificial selection is a process in which humans select certain traits which are to be transported to their offspring. The artificial selection from wild cabbage produced variations such as cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi, kale, etc. Let us now understand the evolution of human species. To understand human evolution, we took the help of excavation, time dating, fossils and DNA and determining DNA sequences using these tools. There are variations in color, form and shape of humans, but they are all members of same species. All have the same basic structure. The number of chromosomes in all is 46 and DNA is also similar. All humans can reproduce with each other. The first member of human race, that is Homo sapiens, has been discovered in Africa. This means that humans must have originated in Africa. A few thousand years ago, our ancestors spread all over Africa and in Asia, Europe, America, etc. in order to live life in the best way. 
generation by generation variations got accumulated which resulted in evolution and thus the human being of today is evolved so today we have learned evidences of evolution chin 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 Thank you.